right, we've got a great show today. As always, uh, we have interesting topics, and uh, I've invited Matt LaCrue back to the program. Not only does uh, Matt have a new book out called The Epic of Humanity, it's co-written by Billy Carson, but I wanted Matt to come back to give us the kind of a deep dive on what's going on in Turkey. I have not been to Turkey. We're doing our first tour, Earth Ancients uh, tour, in uh, August of this year. And I'm looking, I mean, I've been to Istanbul, but Istanbul is very modern, and I didn't get a chance to go to Gobekli Tepe and so forth and so on. But I have invited Matt back for a number of reasons. He's an exciting guy. He's, he's passionate, like I am, about the ancient past. And he is taking orthodoxy and moving it beyond what we understand about our ancient our ancient history and giving us a, a possible scenario for really exciting discoveries. So, hey, Matt, welcome back to Earth Ancients. Great to see you. Hey, Cliff, it's great to see you again. I feel like this is like part two because we just had that other one we did. Um, but but truly, it's an amazing way to come out of that show and then discuss even what came out of that and these new discoveries that you brought up. So thanks for having me back on. Yeah, the panel was fun. I had a lot of uh, good positive uh, comments. It's fun to have more than one person on a panel, but as we discussed before we started, the time uh, issues are much tighter. So, you know, before we start, Matt, I want to get a little information about you. I mean, I haven't had you on by yourself for at least four years now, if not longer. Yeah. Why are you passionate about the past? What What is it? I mean, is it like, oh, it's cool to look at new discoveries and you're in Turkey and Turkey's an ancient place and there's not enough feet on the ground that are looking at stuff. But what is it for you? Yeah. Who cares, man? I mean, why, why should we care? Well, uh, the funny thing about you asking that is that a lot of my life, I was interested in the, in the idea of lost civilizations and I was fascinated by that concept, but I wasn't like a history nerd. You know, you didn't walk up to me in the playground when I was like 12 and be like, Matt, what's the date on like when, uh, you know, like Cortez conquered the Aztec? Like I wasn't bad. Like that wasn't me. I was like looking for crystals and rocks. And I was, you know, wonder I was, I was in awe and wonder of the stars above me and all the kids. Everyone's like walking around doing their thing. And I was just out, out there staring around like and people and it felt very odd to me that I felt very different than everyone else I knew. It, uh, it very much felt more like, um, and my friend that I grew up with, Ryan, would attest to this. He's like, it's like you don't know anything about being here. It's kind of weird. It's, it was an odd thing. It felt like more like I was some kind of a tourist. And I'm like, <gasps> I'm wide-eyed, and I'm looking at everything, and I'm like out in nature, and I'm like blown away. And everybody else is sort of like, okay. And that was my life, though. Mm -hmm. That was my life from a very young age. It's just being completely unorthodox to everyone else. I was like a complete nerd. I didn't have a lot of friends. I was usually spending most of the time out in nature, looking for rocks and crystals and gold and all kinds of things. And I still do that now. Um, <laughs> I never, like, in fact, there's not that much difference between my, uh, my passions from when I was young, except one, and that big one is that I've literally the embodiment of who I am and my mission here, literally, I feel like is, is connecting the ancient narrative of our lost civilizations and the origins of who we are in our consciousness. This, these mysteries, these greater mysteries that encompass the totality of our existence here in this reality. And that became far more than just an interest and something that I was passionate about, but became something that I realized was more of a voice inside me. It was more of like a fire that was burning. That was something that I had to do. And there was nothing else that I really could do. It was like a, that voice and that calling just became stronger and stronger as I got a little older and into a different phases of my life. And now it's to the point where I have to try to go out of my way, and my wife will admit this, to try to do other normal things in life because I am so focused and obsessed with uncovering these ancient mysteries. Yeah, we should uh, also let our listeners know that uh, congratulations, you just got married. I got uh, married back in May, but um, but I mean within the last twelve yeah, months, yeah, buddy. Yeah. Thank, Come on thank now, you. it's been it's been great. Um, she's an amazing woman. She's so beautiful. I feel yeah. very lucky to have such a supportive, smart, um, just an incredible woman that 
is already driven to want to explore the, the greater questions of things anyway. And that's really part of what you want to share that path with. with yeah, that's, that's a perfect partner. Uh, you said something just now that I can relate to, which is that I came back, I, I incarnated, I wanted to show people, tell people, reveal to people that we are part of a much older culture. Yeah. Do you have a sense of uh, of lifetimes in an earlier period, perhaps That's, not yeah. acknowledging them in dreams or whatever, but just because for me, at a very, very young age, I was like being kicked out of Sunday school because I'm like yeah, questioning too. the Bible, yeah. saying, Who, who's Jesus Christ? Did he live? You know, get out of here. Right. You know, get I out of actually, my room. That exact same thing happened to me, too. It's crazy and uncanny you say that because I was in Sunday school and I also got kicked out. So it's funny that we walked a, a similar path in that way, Cliff. Um, but um, you're right. The way to describe it is this. As I've been uncovering and connecting this narrative of from the cuneiform tablets and the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, up through ancient stories around the world, whether it's Vedic texts or ancient Aztec texts, it came, it came more in line with this understanding that there was something that needed to be brought together. There was a, an understanding, there was, a, there was a story, a thread that had gone around the world of, that had been lost, that had been fragmented into pieces over time from catastrophes and conquerors and various other means that have come along and just time itself. Mm -hmm. And for me, something spoke to me as being like an ancient, like an ancient librarian or sage or something like that because, and I say that not in a way to sound cool at all, I don't. It's more of this, this fire within me of to literally dedicate every single thing I have to these mysteries and protecting these ancient texts and the knowledge that's within them and where that comes from. It's the only thing that makes sense to me is it has to come from some previous life that that's was literally what I did. And thus, I guess, like you said, maybe we come back for different reasons. We have many different lifetimes. We all have a great tapestry we play in this grand scheme of reality. But what if some of those lifetimes we had a, a very pivotal role at one point and then we come back to almost replay that role again in another life? And I very much feel like that may be why I'm doing this and, and why maybe some of these secrets are, are connecting and becoming known in a way where it almost seems more familiar than anything else. If that, it's like remembering rather than learning for the first time. Yeah, or or bringing bringing it back as quickly as possible. Um, one one of the interesting things that uh, has been an issue for people is is uh, well known as uh, Graham Hancock and the th hundreds of people that we have on the program uh, each week uh, or every year, I should say, is the fact that we are dealing with a orthodoxy that doesn't recognize earlier sophisticated cultures. Atlantis, Lemuria, uh, you can name it, the people who who perhaps had technology that is more Earth-centered, and I'm dealing with this right now in my writings with the Maya, the earlier Maya, who yeah. did have an Earth-based, geomagnetic, telluric-filled society built around a science that we're just discovering right now. This is a, a huge problem, and, and what you're doing is is great because you're revealing through your writing, through your research, through your travel, uh, that there are earlier civilizations. Why do we need to look at these people with a with a fine tooth comb? Why? Why? Why should we care? I mean, because I, I'm curious. I, I just it's kind of a secondary question to you, but it, it, it's important because why? Well. The first thing to the way to answer that question is to state is to first point out that this view we have of our of our past in the linear way of slowly progressing from like stone tools and you know beating each other over the head with like the whole Flintstone idea that concept that is like kind of silly but the idea that that started there and then we've slowly gotten smarter and figured things out over time is this model that is portrayed to us in nearly everything that we see and and then so when people look back and they're like what do I care about history with some primitive people that are doing something in the jungle or somewhere? Like, I don't care. Like, what does that matter? Like, there's nothing I can learn from them. It could not be more of the opposite, the truth. It literally could not be 
more of uh, the opposite of that statement in literally every single way. And let me tell you why. The first thing is that when we look at the ancient past, this linear progression from starting at a primitive place to getting to where we are now and thinking we're the pinnacle of knowledge in different aspects like that, first of all, I think is very, very wrong. I think it's very, very wrong. And secondly, when we look at the history of how far back our story goes and the levels of civilizations that have risen and fallen over time, looking at something like the Yuga cycles out of the Hindu Yuga cycles, which point out that that's literally the nature of the cyclical nature of our existence here, you find that our story is far more complex than we've been told. And instead of being something where those primitive hunter-gatherers were very stupid back 20, 30,000 years ago, we're now looking at evidence that is emerging from Turkey and other parts of the world, but especially Lake Vaughan that we're going to talk about, that is showing us that there's an entire chapter of, of, our, of our story that is enormous and um, mysterious and mythical and seems to have this origin point that we couldn't figure out, but that the output was that all of these giant civilizations were building temples and pyramids and connecting to that, like you said, that great word, the telluric er energy of the earth. I love it. That energy that flows through the earth that Nikola Tesla figured out through magnetism, that energy, they already had figured that out. So they embodied in everything they did. And so we look now at where we are with cars you know, driving by everywhere and trains and planes flying overhead. And we're like, look at the pinnacle of all of our achievements. And yet we can't even usually, usually say a couple sentences without having some kind of a slang word or using some grammar that's inaccurate. We're like, we don't, we're not that well-educated comparatively to these poets of our past. Go, if you read something like John Taylor's book that I just, I just did a podcast on this book um, two days ago. This is from the 1800s from a man named John Taylor. In reading his words, you realize that we've lost so much, even from the 1800s. The way they speak, the way they see the world, the way they value interaction and respect, and the mm -hmm. way they value all those things, that degradation has continued to the point now where we no longer value our elders. We no longer value our past. We no longer value the things that really matter, like the earth, our role in the universe, our, our, the totality of reaching balance and all, what all, the, all these things can unlock. But that's why I think it's so profound to, to go back to some of these earlier writers and some of these earlier thinkers to remember what we've lost. And of course, if you want to go back further than that, you'll truly see it. Go back to read, read the ancient Sumerian tablets, like read like the Enuma Elish or Atrahasis or Epic of Gilgamesh, um, the earlier versions, because those they were rewritten in other, in other later cultures. But what you find is the most beautiful form in which they were describing our connection to everything, our connection to nature and the source of, of like what we think of as God and the, the totality and the fabric, this invisible fabric that exists all around us that we're almost invisible it's almost invisible to us now we mm. no longer look at it we no longer care about it we no longer respect it in the way that we used to and the ancients are trying we're trying to tell us all along if you want to go back to the very most ancient text of all they say that if we lose the balance and harmony we have within ourselves the microcosm of the macrocosm within the earth and nature and within the universe we literally become disconnected from the true sides of who we are and that is what the true biblical idea of hell is. A, the, an angelic like divine being that starts at a, at a place where it's connected to source yeah. and finds its way so lost eventually that it literally has no connection back to it. You're like describing our, our current uh, civilization. <laughs> right. It, it's, like, it's almost like a, a whisper in the wind of what yeah. used to be long ago that we've forgotten that we're almost trying to listen to like it's an echo but we don't really know what it is and we're trying to rediscover it and that voice from the past that's kind of flowing on the wind that we we hear is getting louder and louder as the ancient past and these discoveries are, are merging the old world is merging with the new world and coming together right now yeah. we're finding that synergy of energy finally we're finding that awakening of consciousness and that flowering that's emerging and i truly believe that these discoveries at lake vaughn is that origin point we've been searching for for thousands of years. 
Yeah, it's funny because you know when we had you on this panel, you were you you definitely have an affinity for for Turkey, uh, but it's gone beyond just an affinity. It appears to be that you have found through others' research a link to the very very ancient past. Let's talk about uh, your interest now. I, I want to talk about this underwater temple uh, at Lake Vaughn. What was the dates they came up with on that? Wasn't it something extreme? Well, it, first of all, it was discovered those those temple temple walls and the and the temple foundations that were left over was discovered underwater in Lake Vaughn at more than one hundred feet deep. Okay. Oh, very deep. But yeah. only in two thousand seventeen. You know, think about how. Right now, if you go on forums or you're on anything ancient, Gobekli Tepe and Karahan, Karahan Tepe are sort of, everyone's talking about them because they're, they're, they're shaking things up and they're yeah. changing our timelines. But those were found during World War II. These discoveries in Lake Vaughn, if people are wondering why they haven't heard of them or why a lot of this seems brand new, is because they are brand new. They're brand new discoveries in, in, in the scheme of history. Like mm -hmm. if you find a site like, for instance, when they discovered Ionis in 1989, they didn't discover the temple. They discovered the lower megalithic walls way down below. It took them 30 years to find the temple. 30 years to get all the way to the point where they could find that Haldi temple with all those ancient symbols that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. So even if you make a discovery in some location, it doesn't mean that you find the heart of what you're looking for right away. Right. And what you were getting to your point about these discoveries is that I was conferring with conferring with a megalithic expert of the world, Brian Forster, who is one of the experts on this film. And he was I was asking him, I'm like, Brian, is this the only underwater megalithic temple wall that has megalithic precise blocks anywhere in the world? Because I can't find any other ones. He, he thought about it for a minute. And he's like, I believe that's the only one in the world as well, <clears throat> which is already phenomenally fascinating because then yeah. you have something that's in the in a place that doesn't exist anywhere else but then you at then beds the question well okay so it's not a primitive wall i'm not saying there's no other underwater stuff we have plenty of stuff off alexandria and egypt and other areas off greece and so on but how could you have cliff a highly sophisticated megalithic temple wall that was clearly built over 100 feet underwater in lake vaughn if our history that we're told with civilizations emerging out of Mesopotamia is only 6,000 years old. It doesn't make any sense if you have over 100 feet underwater, it would mm -hmm. have had to predate the, the lake levels of that lake, right? And that's exactly what they found. It was fascinating to read. If anyone's curious to go read some very interesting papers, go read about the underwater discoveries in Lake Vaughan and where they discuss geologically and climatologically when the lake would have been low enough to be able to build at that level. And some of the scientists were like throwing out dates like 15,000 years ago because yeah. that's what the glacial minimum for when that lake was as low as it was, which literally ties in exactly with the time frame of everything we're talking about now with this new timeline of history and these lost civilizations. So who are the people who built, I mean, because the photographs that you present on your website of this uh, ruin in Lake Vaughn, it's beautifully designed. It's yeah. like really, you know, high high tech or or uh, we don't want to say machine because we can't tell if the stones were cut with a machine or not. But nice tools though, like high end. Yeah, stuff. really high end, beautiful. Not Bronze cut Age, form. not Bronze Age. Yeah, that's so. That's the point. So what what is the suspicion in terms of a, of an age uh, for yeah. that? Because we we're talking about the glacial melts into the yeah. river. That could be uh, pre-Ice Age or maybe at the end of the Younger Dryas, you just su suggested 12,000, 15,000 in the teens. Sure. Is it older than that? Yeah, I actually think, and I'm going to make a definitive statement here. As someone who studied every meg megalithic temple and every megalithic site in the world that I can find, and every temple site too, because we have to remember the early Sumerians with Eridu and Shirupak, they didn't build with megalithic stones. They they specifically built with with brick for a purpose that they wanted at that time. And it's actually describes in the tablets and I'll paraphrase. It says th they laid bricks in pure places. And so they had a reason for that, for that, but that also makes it so 
any kind of brick structures can't really survive unless they're buried under a massive amount of uh, inund inundation layer of mud, which is why Eridu and Shrubeck sur survive. However, in saying that, when you excavate and go look at those sites, you don't see the remains of, there's no beautiful temple still. Like it's just all eroded with pottery and fragments of cuneiform tablets, right? It's so ancient, there's nothing really left in terms of it, its megalith, its nature of its, of its temples and its structures. They're not really much left. So having said that, I believe that Ionis Temple, with the absolutely stunning recreation they put into it, the, the University of Ankara, Istanbul out there, Vaughan University, Professor Isikli, phenomenal job. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You guys, seeing that site when they first discovered it, Cliff, when they first uncovered the Haldi Temple at Ionis, it was like, it looks like an apocalypse destroyed it. There's vitrification marks strewn all over the walls, extreme melting and burning. Um, things are thrown all over the place. It looks like a tsunami and then some kind of coronal mass ejection heat event just, just destroyed that whole area, which is why they, they found it under such an enormous amount of sediment. But getting back to what you were saying at the beginning, the these discoveries under Lake Vaughan with this megalithic temple shows us that there's a timeline here that is mysterious because if Gobekli Tepe has been radiocarbon dated further further to the west um, as being 11,600 years old, it begs the question on how old these temples could be, though, because when we look at the ancient Sumerian stories, this Christian Noah figure that was from the original Sumerian, last Sumerian king of Sharupak, known as Untapishtim, or Zayasudra, you find that that's where the heart of that entire story came from. And mm. it's this epic of a last line of Sumerian kings and priests that were going to be destroyed from this event, and they one, one of them with his family was warned, and that's where the story comes from. But that's how that family got from the Sumerian region over to Vaughn was from literally a, a catastrophe on the earth. And it's very true. It's very well documented in at least four different sets of tablets. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the Atrahasis, the Legend of Itzubar, and there is even a couple others too that are kind of obscure that describe that, that flood story mm -hmm. in, in almost the exact same way with this seed of mankind being, seed of mankind being preserved from an ancient bloodline of the Sumerian king and his family, his three sons. And, his, and they, they are then the ones that were finding these bizarre kings lists coming out of Lake Vaughn from Cliff, okay? That's yeah. what I mean is like this mythical kind of Christian um, story that is like, of course, I think there's a lot of it that's not accurate in the dating and all those things. But there's this origin point back to the original Sumerian versions and all these Babylonian versions and then what you find is that makes it so like mind blowing is that there's a site at around Lake Vaughn at the southern end of the lake called Cavus Tepe. And at that site, there's a megalithic wall that's surrounded by the more primitive Urartian work. And in that wall, it has a translation cliff. OK. And in that translation, it says and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have it right in front of me, but it says something like. I, King Hike and Haldi built this great temple and this civilization and all these things. And you see that and you look up King Hike in Wikipedia. You don't even need to go in deep, deep, deep. Just, it's anywhere. It's very obvious. You find that it says right in there that he literally was a direct descendant of Japheth, who is a direct, who was one of the, one of the three sons of Noah, the last Sumerian version of this Untapishtim. It's like the whole story came full circle. The whole thing became a reality from like the myth and legend side to the archaeological evidence driven side. The, whole, the two things merged and we found these mysteries that just got deeper and deeper. That was just the beginning. That was like the tip of the iceberg mm. for how deep that mystery truly went. So to answer your question, though, how old is it? I don't even think that those disasters that that caused that event that led to them going there and then building that. I don't even think that was the last Ice Age, Younger Dryas 12,000 years ago which is what I think destroyed Atlantis and all these others. I think it was an entire event before that, which is how they were able to then pass that golden age around the world, which was then destroyed by the younger Dryas. But that means that Ionis, I truly believe, is the oldest and most important temple on, in the world. And I think it's, it's more than 20,000 years old. Yeah, I was, I was waiting for you to throw that at me. Uh, 
it's interesting how the Sumerians chronicle these guys uh, in their in their writing in their uh, their tablets. Um, but you are. Uh, I want to continue with this a little bit, then we're going to jump yeah. into this book because it transitions very nicely. And don't forget the new addition to the team, too. Yeah, we should mention that that Jin Deo, who's been on Earth Ancients for years, has now joined uh, Matt's team. Uh, and uh, so Jin, Jin's a real deal uh, archaeologist. She's done research and done studies. And study. anthropologist, too. Yeah, she's an anthropologist. Well, obviously, a, you have you have to be you get one like with the origins, and you get archaeology. It's just yeah, she, she's going to be fun to. It's going to be fun to hear what she has to say. But you're assembling this group with the goal of what? The goal is to have expertise from every single possible area we can, so that we're in when we're in a place that has megalithic stuff and archaeology. We need to have people that are experts in megalithic stuff and archaeology. When, we, when we're in the same place that has religious iconography and ancient symbols that tie back to the origins of spirituality and religion, we mm -hmm. need someone that has deep, deep knowledge in within from the church, but but is not from within, but has come out, that has the biblical background, but also that spiritual shamanic understanding, right? And then mm -hmm. we also have to have people that understand ancient texts like me from the degree of where these names and where all these stories come from and where all, we can follow this thread. And so that ended up emerging into five experts from around the world. Myself, Billy Carson, Brian Forrester, Jennifer Deo, um, and now um, Paul Wallace as well to make five total to create this um, like a dream team. And I just want to I want to go back, though, on what you had mentioned a minute uh, a second ago about Jennifer Deo. If anybody wants to watch that wonderful um, panel that we did just recently that is on Cliff's channel and is on mine. It was amazing because I had never met Jennifer. Cliff introduced me to her just out of the blue in that panel. And you'll see right in it, like during the process, I'm kind of like smiling and I'm like, hmm. Because you can, I've already figured it out very clear that Jennifer was the one. She was the only archaeologist I've ever met who's open-minded in that way to look at evidence that is from an academic and evidence-driven place. She's mm -hmm. got a lot of experience. She's very smart. But she comes to the place where she's not going to be rigid, just like every other archaeologist. And so I feel very honored that Jennifer has joined the team and is willing to help investigate this mystery to truly see if we can change history. So that's what it's all about, bringing these together for a film that's going to go not only in Turkey, but we're, we're, we're working right now to see if we can make it happen on another mysterious country in the Middle East that I can't mention yet. But then <laughs> we're going we're gonna to include... Um, Peru and Bolivia as this expedition around the world to to follow this mystery and try to see if we can lead it back to the very origins of everything. Hmm. So the goal is to have real solid uh, content for this film, but the secondary uh, result of this research would be that you would be publishing in papers your your. Yeah. Uh, work right yeah let me get let me explain that for a minute because it's important that people understand the scope of this is that i i parted ways i was working at gaia back in november up until november and i parted parted ways in gaia with these new discoveries and started my started my own company uh -huh. called ionis legacy okay that became the entire foundation behind the film the discoveries everything it was the engine behind this this and all of this work and so i'm doing that full time now with bringing on a couple people soon, which is incredibly exciting. And we're going to be launching this as a media and discovery company to then go multiple times, not even once. And so far this year, we're scheduled to go to Lake Vaughn and those sites two times. We're going to be there for like a month total. We're going to be capturing, we're going to be doing full surveys, no digging, because we're not going to break any laws or rules, but we're going to be doing measuring surveys we're going to take measurements of the stones we're going to be doing everything we can that we're allowed to do to then go forward and write a whole book on this um, going forward and jennifer might actually join me in that book we're still talking about it but at least we're going to be coming at this in the most academic way possible to present these this findings um with every single avenue of academic and i guess um sort of like studying background um sort of self-studied 
background as well as the academic side sort of coming together to try to see if we can prove that this this is truly tr is is accurate. And so far, um, the consensus is that yes, this is not at all what we've been told. This is not the Urartian civilization that that we're showing with these sites. It is from an, another completely different epoch in history, and now it's just about going and proving it. I I want to ask you about this because when Gobekli Tepe was first revealed to be was it 9,500 BC? And then uh, Karahan Tepe is, I don't know if it's older or not, a few thousand years probably older. Probably the same thing. They're pro I think they were built around the They're same pretty thing. close, yeah. yeah. That was hard for the community to swallow. Stepping it's just, stones, my friend. Stepping there, stones. There's still, I mean, I remember, uh, and this is not that long ago, yeah. uh, the Egyptologist uh, uh, Zahi Hawass was asked about Gobekli Tepe, and he was like, what? Who, what, what, what's that about? Which is <laughs> yeah. scary. Well, he knew. He knew. I mean, he knew. It's, yeah. It's an and, but this way is what we're off. you're dealing with. You're dealing with a yes. community that just will not budge on a timeline with sophisticated cultures. And how, I mean, you're hoping to show them in the same kind of a context, like here's Gobekli Tepe, but now we have an, an even earlier people from Turkey that were, were much, much more sophisticated because one of my big problems with Gobekli Tepe is although it's great dating, it's very rudimentary. The sculptures just the, are- Just the T-shaped pillars are the only thing that is of of, like, of an interest to me. In terms I mean, of the, that, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm a trained artist I'm, and sculptor. And when I see the sculptures, I'm like, this is very crude. These guys well, are like, you know- What do you think about that compared to like some of the beautiful stuff at Lake Vaughan though? Well, that's what I was saying. The stonework in the, on this underwater uh, uh, temple, it looks like Pumapuku, or it yeah, looks like yeah, uh, exactly. very sophisticated Egypt temple work. So it's like, and that's the big problem with with uh, a lot of alternative uh, work is that you go way, way back, and you see extremely sophisticated machine cut stones sculptures. Yeah, we can go spend a day on that. And then there's a, a period where it recedes and then it picks up again. So, and this is where our, I think archaeology has a problem is that they are confused as to where these timelines, and this is my yes. big problem, is the timelines are screwed up. Exactly. That, and, and, that, and that cannot be more apparent with a site called Kef. Okay, Kef Temple. It's called Kef Kalesi, but I don't use the word Kalesi because it means fortress. It's, yeah. not, it's kind of like calling the Great Pyramid of Giza Khufu's pyramid because he had nothing to do with it, so it's silly. But anyway, um, when you go to Kef, I I've shown on that, and you've seen that giant box relief that has the winged gods and all that, just like it's made out of basalt. It's like some of the most beautiful work you've like ever yeah. ever seen in the world. It's amazing, and the, the symbols and iconography in that is so fine tuned in the layers of how they did it. It's beyond comprehension. I I'm of the opinion that I'm. I am skeptical that it was even done by hand. I, I don't understand how it was done. I don't, no megalithic stone ex, uh, expert has ever been able to explain to me, especially something like that three by three by four foot giant basalt um, bo box relief that is, of course, a big part of all of this, but how they could have carved that. in literally, like, have you seen it has layers? It has three different layers that are have been carved into it with carvings oh, yeah. within it. It's yeah. like, Mind blown. How could they could do that? But the point I'm trying to make is the reason I said all that about how amazing it is, is because that's how the archaeologists found felt when they found it, when they discovered it, and th and that site was not found during I Ionis. It was like a whole other time period, and it became sort of lost, and no one ever heard of it again. But it was found in in 1958, 1959 ish. That time period, they were in excavating and they found that giant box relief with fragments and other things and what's really sad and i talked to jennifer about this too and it's something that we're reading and talking about for the film to discuss is that there was archaeologists that came in that established the narrative of turkey before that okay and then when these archaeologists came in to excavate like kef above adel Savez, and they found that they were amazed by it they were they they wrote pages about this and about the icons and everything. But what was sad about it was that they kept talking about the symbols and how the symbols that had been identified earlier by the other archaeologists 
it was like they were trying to mold to it and it was difficult for them. They would say things like, well, we've been told that this looks like uh, a lance or a spear, but it really looks a lot like the tree of life symbol on here as well. It's like they're arguing with each other. Yeah. In the, but in a respectful way where they're mm -hmm. not overstepping, they're, they're like discussing how, well, it doesn't really match, but, and they're trying to like make it bend. So they'll be like, well, the lance or the tree of life image. It's like one's a war symbol and one's an, a symbol of like balance and harmony in nature and ascension. Like they literally couldn't be the more opposite symbols. But what that did is it created this entire mentality to try to, to try to take the entire teachings that are within that and try to weave it into the Urartian war empire that made primitive Bronze Age tools and all this stuff that had none of the artistic work. The last point I want to make, Cliff, they mentioned how the interesting thing is that they found nothing culturally as advanced with artwork or pottery or stonemasonry anywhere else in the Urartian civilization. Hmm. And instead of being like, well, that's strange, their answer was, well, I guess they figured it out. <laughs> it's like that was their answer. And I'm not putting down those archaeologists that said that. They're just doing the best they can. They're just <laughs> trying to do the best they can. It gives us the avenue to come in now and to try to really lay this in the way that's evidence and objective driven. And, and Jennifer has already looked at that and agrees with me. That we're gonna, we're yeah. obviously not going to go with the Urartian background here because it doesn't make any sense any longer. And just like around the world, Cliff, whether it's the Inca or of, of you know, Machu Picchu of, or Oye Te Tambo or Saxe Waman there or Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, it's the same thing. There's an older story in the bottom and then a younger story on top. But you see that in Egypt. You see that in Mexico. You literally see it everywhere in the world. And that's the timeline that we need to get established so that we can create this uh, understanding of when things uh, occurred and not lump it all together and get it all confused like we are right now. Yeah, I'm going to look forward to uh, hearing from you and, of course, Jenna and on uh, what you guys put together and uh, the outcome, uh, obviously, the, the movie, the documentary, and, and whatever books or uh, white papers that you, you release. One of the things, I, as a final note, one of the things that I have come to realize is that the orthodoxy, the academic community, is hindered in so many ways. And I got a wake-up call when I was introduced to Dr. Edwin Barnhard, who's a Mayanist, who we... We just did a tour with him in Chiapas, Mexico. He made a statement that was profound to me, very, very clear, very to the point, which is that we only know and have only excavated about 1% of the Maya world. Right. We only have 30 known cities, and we know there are literally hundreds of thousands of, of communities from Honduras to Yucatan, under Mexico. The rain, under the jungle, like lost, right? And, and and he said that, and he said, how in the hell can we know? So, right. and this is what I try to get across to the listener, is that science, uh, science and, and these uh, archaeologists are doing guesswork. Yeah. This is our history. It's guessing. And, yeah. and to say that we know conclusively about a culture that is over 3,000, 5,000 years old is not fair to, to the reader. And it's also unfair to alternative researchers like yourself, like myself, like hundreds of other people that you know. How do you feel about that going forward? And how do you work with the orthodoxy that is rigid, unyielding in their understanding of previous early civilization? Yeah. You, you know how if you've ever been in your life in many different situations. Maybe you've um, just been in a situation with people you know around you where maybe you have an idea that is rejected by everyone else and you feel very isolated. And it's like, am I sure I'm right about this? Or like how? And then let's say in, in, instead you like, maybe you meet a new friend and you're part of that group and their friend's like, guys, listen, I've been studying this. Like everything he's saying is, I think it's right. Like he, you really should listen to what he's saying. And then a third friend of maybe a group of six, right, is like, I think he's right too. And then they, like, they, they walk over next to you. And then before long, everyone else is like, yeah, I think maybe we should look at this in a different way. 
And but you're like, wait a minute, you guys just told me I was like ridiculous and silly six months ago or whatever it is. I'm just these, this is a hypothetical um, analogy, but that concept is basically archaeology. That's archaeology. That's that's the whole and mentality of archaeology are these academic moguls of their time, these these heroes that have laid this foundation and they're well studied and they're up, you know, sitting in a stiff room with a <laughs> they're all like, oh, no, no. no, like let that go. That's not the that's not the future anymore. Archaeology is being done by young people around the world that are open minded and you just want to uncover the truth now. And so you have all these students that are part of academic universities that are like amazed by this stuff but they're waiting everyone's waiting for that tipping point to have all those friends walk over to the other side of the group and that's what's happening i believe right now and i mean right now look at something like it's a stepping stone thing look at something like gobekli tepe and Carahan, pushing that narrative back finally being accepted a little bit and mm -hmm. you get things like graham hancock's ancient apocalypse getting the mainstream start getting more understood and accepted all the stuff that's going on with podcasts around the world and it's blowing all this stuff up. People are like, all right, let's look at this in a different light now. And then now, for the first time ever, ever, you have in the, in the light of having the interest of being knowledge and getting at the truth and people that have their hearts in it and they're in putting everything they have in this, you have actual academics for the first time. Archaeologists coming forth, they're like, we need to look at this again. I don't, I don't know if we've been right about this. Sorry. But it's time. We need to look at all of this again. And then I think it's like that domino effect. You get a couple academics. They start agreeing. And then all of it just flows the other way. And I think we are right at that tipping point right now. That was my next question is how do you hope to have the orthodoxy buy into your, your work. Let me tell you how we're going to do it. We have a whole plan. <laughs> the, the film, the film is going to just be this, this obviously like kind of like the great, it's like the dinner of the day, the big, yeah. the big event, right? The big dinner and where the film is going to be taking people in expeditions around the world and showing all these things with experts. It's going to be incredible. But on the, all the, on the other sides of that, there's still, there's a breakfast, there's a lunch, there's dessert. What I mean by that is we're going to be going to all these sites and we're going to be doing surveys. We're going to be doing all this professional work that's not even part of the movie where it's like measuring everything, looking at it from like the super nerdy scientific angle to um, you're following protocol. Right. We're going to we're going to hit this from every angle. Films, okay. um, right. Like back back behind the scenes measurements and analysis and papers and books. And so we're going to be tackling this from every side we can to try to bring the world's attention to what looks like this great mystery that really like whenever someone looks at this i've gotten very little pushback and i think that's a good thing i would love if people would like to come back and challenge this but maybe it's one of those things cliff where we've been searching for some something collectively a lot of us have been searching for something and it's coming together now to this point where it was it was an origin of knowledge that has been far more important and preserved in secret places than we ever realized, Cliff. Because of the cross that is at Ionis in Andesite, one of the hardest stones on earth. Yeah. The first cross that was lowered there by Haldi, this Anuna god that's literally identical to Enlil and Zeus in Greece. You see this, he's passing the cross and these doorways of knowledge and how to reach ascension and all these things. But that cross, that specific cross, the exact one for my honest just so happens to cliff become the exact cross that the Knights Templar were protecting. And also the cross that then became the Vatican, that the number the cross on the Vatican, the Pope, what, what his cloak that he wears, that cross and the British Royals have the same exact cross for my honest, not the Christian crucifix cross, but the honest cross. And what it's telling us is that there's an ancient, ancient story that's been protected here, that's been preserved, but has been not known about. And if anything, maybe it was lost at one point. Hmm. And then over time, we're finding it, finding our way back to it again. But I believe that the secrets that come out of Ionis and this, the civilization I'm calling the Lost Era civilization around that whole region with Kef Temple and Kavis and others and the underwater stuff, the secrets that come out of those incredible 
um, artifacts, reliefs, and these, these symbols in, in the ancient megaliths and all the teachings that it embodies that then travel around the world everywhere. That becomes the core of nearly every lost civilization. I truly believe that when we, under, when we finally uncover the mysteries of that, and I have very interesting, very powerful people around the world that are interested in this and are joining forces with me. But mm. when we un uncover the mysteries of this, we will finally uncover the mysteries that has led us so far away from who we truly are in our origins of the divinity of what mankind actually is. Very cool. I was waiting for you to say, you know, Elon Musk just gave us half a billion and uh, we'll be not using... Elon, but <laughs> hey, hey, we're getting there. Let's let's put it that way. No, okay? I'm serious. He's totally into this kind of stuff. He'd be a I great <laughs> sponsor. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh before we before we transition into this new book, um uh do you have a place where people can send donations and read yeah, more about it? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate that. For anyone who wants to support the film, because we're trying to raise as much money as possible. Yeah, I was going to say, really, this is costly, the research it's alone. It's Right now, it's four countries. Now, I have not mentioned one of those countries yet, because I want to make sure we get that secured 100% before I mention it. But one of them is amazing. Like, when I mention that, people will go wild. So try to think big there, um, somewhere that the outside world hasn't really seen. Um, but when... When, when if people want to support this film, because honestly, we're trying to do this with whatever we can. Um, we're trying to come from this from every angle we can, including um, crowdfunding, right? And so if people, yeah. if people want to be a part of this, there's incentives that uh, you can go to the stageoftime.com and go to the documentary page. And what you'll see if you scroll down with all the team members and the information and the images and locations, you'll see a silver and a gold tier for people that want to be part of this movement it's not even the movie it's the movement the film is part of a movement and so if you give a hundred dollars you get to have your name on the website but if you give 500 or more you get to have your name in the credits of the film at the end and that's and that's on there right now if you want to be a part of history and a lot of people are coming out of the woodwork people i never imagined it's almost turning into like a like um like an indiana jones movie it's very <laughs> cool um, but I will say, um, I really appreciate everyone that believes and supports in this. And if you want to be a part of that film, it just keeps getting bigger and better. And it gives us more to do more that we can have to make this into the most grand and incredible experience possible. Excellent. So the stage of time.com. And then there's yeah. what, uh, 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 you scroll down, there's a donation, uh, yeah, uh, there's a, there's links you can contribute and okay, there's plenty good. of places for that. Like check it out. Um, it's really, I really feel an honor. You'll see all the names on there. So if anyone hasn't actually gone to look, I'm very diligent about putting those in and you'll see a lot of people I believe in this and put and put their, um, some of their money and time into this. Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right. I want to transition into this uh, new book, the Epic of uh, Humanity. You co-wrote it with Billy Carson Yeah. and a great cover, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I, Billy Carson and I, I got to tell a little story is that Billy came out to visit me three and a half years ago, um, getting out four now, out in Maine where I nobody really knew me. And I was starting out. I was unknown. And I didn't even have the, I think I had just published the stage of time or something like that before that, um, relatively recently. And Billy came out and we were sitting on um, these beautiful ledge that sits over the ocean at Portland Head Lighthouse. If anyone listening who's from Maine or New Hampshire will know that spot. Beautiful spot. We're sitting there on the cliffs, and I'm sitting there with Billy, and we're, we were there to, to do something for his network. It wasn't even related to what I'm about to tell you at all. We had no plan for that. Sitting there, we're having lunch, and I'm like, Billy, we should write a book together. And, he, and I said, we should write a book that's based on the epic of our entire story, but lay it out with timelines, and we try to give evidence to lay the whole thing to create a complex timeline that helps the whole thing unfold in a way where we can say, well, we're going to place um, like Sharupak here. What's the evidence that Sharupak actually existed at that time? So the book is about our story and our struggles of almost being destroyed from catastrophes and having the ancient sages then travel around the world and then create those civilizations with that lost knowledge, which of course I feel like now derives back to Lake Vaughn. But the book is a lot more than that, Cliff. The idea was not just about telling our timeline and not just about telling our story. There was something a lot greater in the purpose. And I told Billy, I said, I said, you know, I put a lot of ancient texts in my book, The Stage of Time, my previous book. And as I'm talking, you'll have a segment that's got a, a, uh, you know, a segment of excerpt from that text. And it's very powerful. 
And I have it so you can like, if you want to look up, if you want to look up the octrahasis, you can go find where that is and all of that, right? And I realized that perhaps that's the most important thing that we're, we've lost is that if you want to go read the greatest teachings and the greatest writings that have been left behind by mankind, how are you going to know where to look? How are you going to know on this internet full of all this stuff and all these misdirections? Like, how are you going to know what to read? How are you going to know what's important? And not that we are the ones that are supposed to determine that. But so many other people have already determined that long before me on these amazing pieces of work that are either the oldest things we have or yeah. are come from this time period that all can join together with these teachings and all these things. And there's, there's an enormous amount of them, whether it's Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian tablets or, or Egyptian texts like the Book of the Dead and others like pyramid texts to Gnostic texts and even Greek texts like the Timaeus and Critias and, and so on. We have many, many others. We have Vedic texts and all, all those others. But you realize that perhaps that's the most important thing all along is preserving the most important ancient teachings of all of mankind and put them in one place. And that is what we did with the Epic of Humanity. And we're prideful to say, and it did exceed the stage of time a little bit, but I, we're prideful to say that this has the most amount of ancient text excerpts of any book in the world. And it'll give people the opportunity to it, that wide variety of different things to then come back and be like, have this totality of knowledge and understanding that then doesn't just come from our words and trusting our words, but reading the actual words of the ancients themselves. Yeah, it's that got a lot of a great is. material. You know, it's funny, you just brought up timeline and you feature a timeline uh, of your own creation that begins approximately 200,000 years ago. Yes, yes. And yes. Uh, you get into the Anunnaki and the fact that your belief is that we are a uh, a hybrid civilization. We were actually uh, planted here uh, by a, a much earlier civilization. And there's a lot of people that are beginning to, 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 to talk about that. But not aliens, though. I'm not a UFO alien guy. That's not I, and I'm glad you said okay. that because that's, that's not I have a huge things. problem with the ancient alien. I think they've destroyed the whole concept by basically anything that's not explainable was ancient alien. Uh, I have a very different perspective around that. And yeah. I think that's one of the reasons, actually, that a lot of powerful people and people interested in this in a tangible academic way have come around me in this because we're looking at this in more of a way of, I think we haven't understood our reality in the right way. The ancients have told us all along, whether it's the Gnostics, that this is really an illusion and that there's so much more around us and that perhaps what we are missing is understanding the multidimensional side that exists with us and any beings that are related to us in a way that perhaps we haven't been looking closely enough about what are considered angels and demons nearly enough right. in the way of which that's been the influence all along and not this influence of a UFO with some green men coming down the landing and then creating this, even though like that whole concept of that whole concept doesn't make sense because when they show these ascended beings or these beings that are related to us, they look exactly like us. Right. So at one point we have to stop and be like, mm, let's look at this whole like great alien narrative and let's backtrack a little bit and maybe look back at a different way to look at this. That's a little bit more of uh, really, if, if anything, Cliff, it only empowers us in our role and importance in the universe in a way that makes you feel a lot more um, a part of something rather than being like, well, someone randomly came here and they just wanted to play around with DNA and hey, poof, we came out of nothing. We came yeah. out of some like Neanderthals and like apes and that's it. It's so much more complex than that. It's more yeah. of like a grand stage in the universe where we're playing out how to exist in a physical body, but we are actually a multidimensional consciousness and these like ascended beings, but we get come back here and we're part of this like grand stage of reality, like almost like a movie where we're almost trying to find our way back but it's part of this karmic system where we have to live lifetimes of learning lessons and finding your way back to, to where we began. It's actually quite beautiful. It really yeah. is. And I think, I think that um, if anything, we should be going outside and looking up at the sun <laughs> and just being like, amazing that we have this existence. Thank you. And that's exactly. really what this is about. Uh, the book has so many fun dimensions. I want you to talk a little bit about the clay uh, cuneiforms which are featured in the very beginning. And one of the areas that 
just as a complete disconnect for me, and it seems to be for academia, is these uh, Sumerian kings lists. Yeah. And it, we also see it in Egypt, too. And yep. the yep. academic world uses it to identify known pharaohs. Yes. And here it's the same thing with the Sumerian. We know about... It's literally certain... identical. It's like yeah, well, yeah. they're almost the same thing. Which it's is crazy. very interesting, too. Yeah. The, reigns, the reigns of these, like bloodline royals That's but i want you to that, talk a little right? bit about the fact that the sumerians go back tens of thousands of years if not further with some of these very very early kings and there's a disconnect with orthodoxy because it's like well wait a minute we can't have sophisticated cultures that go back 10 15 yeah. 20 150 <laughs> 200 000 years what's the deal with that i mean well, i the, accept yeah. it but they don't well, the first thing is having an anthropologist now, we have to remember, let's look at other anthropologists like Lloyd Pye. They very distinctly found that the human brain doubled in size 200,000 years ago. Yeah. I'm not creating a 2,000 year timeline just because of the Sumerian king list. There's a lot of other factors in place to create that timeline that is, is, is woven into that. The Sumerian mm -hmm. king list is just one of them. And that simply is the dynasties of the original Sumerians, which are separated by a catastrophe, that they a new line of kings has to take over the new world. It's very distinctly shown in the Legend of Atana. If anybody would like to read the Legend of Atana, I wish I had that on me to read right now. I don't, but it's basically like it goes into saying, well, there was a disaster on the earth, everything was destroyed, and then there was a, a new king that was chosen to be the architect of the new world. It literally says that an architect of the new world. His name was Atana. That's why it's called the Legend of Atana. He became the first king of Kish. What the year dynasty. was that? Well, that's the thing that we're trying to figure out. Is we have no idea because oh. we're told that that time period of Kish came from like 4,000 years ago in that Mesopotamian era, but with the Syrian time. But what we're finding is that, no, 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 no. Hold on, guys. Let's look at Sharupak. We found three distinct layers of civilizations there, not one. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if you were to look at a region like Iraq, the Sumerians was like an ancient, ancient legacy that had nothing to do with the same language at all of the Assyrians or Babylonians or Chaldeans. Just because they write in cuneiform wedges does not mean it's the same language. I think that, I don't think a lot of people know that. No. It's important to understand because the Sumerians were like this mysterious ancient language. And I want to use paraphrase what Jen said. She said, you don't get a fully cooked culture like the Sumerians out of nowhere. She said that and she's 100 percent right. There's this like mysterious origins of the Sumerians that they don't even state that they invented everything because they literally invented everything. And I mean, like everything came from there. They invented writing, the first writing, the first um, uh, currency, agriculture, the building blocks of civilization, um, laws and rules, metallurgy, astronomy, mathematics. You literally could go on and on and on. It's almost like if you were to create a civilization, you're like an angelic group of beings. You're like, Okay, let's create a civilization here. What is necessary to do so? Well, we will lower the divine laws and rules, and they actually had a name for it. I haven't talked about this nearly enough, Cliff, and I'm glad you brought this up. They call those set of rules that they lower, like the Code of Hammurabi, where there's like moral laws and rules and how to govern a society, the things needed to create a civilization. They called them the Mies, M E apostrophe S. <laughs> the royal Mies. They did. And they discussed how the Mies, these, these tablets, with like the commandments, like Moses, these commandments would be on these tablets and they would reside in a certain city. Okay? They would reside in a certain city when they were there in the royal library, these, these like royal Mies from the gods. That city would be chosen to be the dominant city of the gods and, the, and it was Eridu for a long time and eventually it moved over to Uruk, Ur and then eventually Sharupak and others and moved and at one point it talks about how Anana stole the me from Eridu okay it's mm. wild okay you can go read what's called Enki in the world order you find out that Anana was in charge of other civilizations um, in other parts of the world like maybe Iran and um, parts of maybe Turkey and other areas, but it's described how she stole it. She stole the, the Mead tablets and then brought it to their patron city and they almost got in like a war over it. 
Mm -hmm. It's really, really fascinating. But the point I'm trying to make, we got down that long road, is this was decided long ago. It was like a blueprint for civilizations to then create them. But then the Sumerians were destroyed by that catastrophe, that flood, the first deluge. And that's where the whole Noah story with these bloodline sons of like Vaughn come from because they were then tasked with creating the new world. And but they but they had a lot of tools that the Sumerians didn't have. They had the megalithic building style. They had these teachings of ascension that were lowered at Ionis and others that then passed around. And so what I see it as the story that makes the most sense is that imagine three sons governed by divine gods. Anana who became Athena to the Greeks. She's mm -hmm. right there. Imagine Enlil right there who became Haldi is right there and Enki's right there. And they're like these like the, they're like, they're basically the Elohim of this council of deciding our fates. And they say, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, you shall therefore go about each part of the earth and create the new golden age. And Japheth is shown just in Christian, it's just like Christian Hebrew bloodlines. He's taking over Europe. He's supposed to have Europe and Greece. And then you see Shem is supposed to be in charge of Egypt, the great pyramids of Egypt, which is exactly who. John Taylor thinks in the 1800s built the Great Pyramids of Egypt, the sons of Noah Shem. Really? And that is where these, this has led me down that rabbit hole that has blown my mind because I didn't have any evidence to support that until I found Cavus Tepe and these other sites. But it was absolutely fascinating because I realized, and so then Cham, the other son, was tasked with going through Iran and India, Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And you're like, whoa. So wait a minute. So Japheth is supposed to go to Europe with the ancient Greeks, and you find through Timaeus and Critias that during Atlantis, there was a proto-Athenian civilization that rivaled Atlantis, one of the greatest civilizations in Earth's history that, be, that came out of Japheth and Lake Vaughan in, in Greece. And to this day, in Athens, if you go to Athens, Greece, and I would really like to add this to the film if we could. There's a possibility we might be able to. Let's see, okay? And maybe, or maybe just another trip. But if you go to Athens today to prove this theory, there is a wall called the Pyx Wall that is gigantic megalithic wall, beautiful, 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 that it has the same indentations of three levels on the stones as this teaching that comes from Lake Vaughan as well. Um, and, and I want to pull this up. I want to say very, very much thank you to the comment that someone left on my channel because I'm discovering things all the time. I'm, I'm learning things all the time. We don't, all, none of us all know everything. So this was pointed out to me that in Greece, there is the Greek equivalent of Noah is known as Dusa Leon. Hmm. Italy is the Greek equivalent of Noah in Greece, showing that that whole story connected all through. Um, and that's really where this has become wild because you're, you're imagining like, wait a minute. So Tiwanaku and Pumapunku in Bolivia with the same symbols. Same stonework, same cross. That's what I wanted to talk to you about because you actually show in this book, uh, Epic of Humanity, similar design features in Pumapuku and uh, early Turkey and also perhaps construction, uh, yeah. uh, engineering that's very similar. It's literally, it's not even similar, Cliff. It's actually weird because let's take for a minute Lake Vaughn in eastern Turkey. It's the largest turkey lake in Turkey. It's over 1,000 feet deep. It's actually over 1,500 feet deep. Incredibly deep. It's one of the deepest lakes on Earth. And you remember Easter Island, the Moai, there's this obsession with a navel. Remember? Right. A navel into the Earth. Okay? Right. Meanwhile, the really bizarre thing, because these are sun temples, by the way. If anyone wants to know, they're solar sun temples. Ionis is a sun temple. Meanwhile, across the world in South America, you have another giant lake high elevation lake that's over a thousand feet deep called Lake Titicaca. And both of those lakes are surrounded by volcanoes, like massive volcanoes. And they all have basalt and andesite. In fact, the word andesite comes from the word Andes from South America, but they were building andesite in, in Lake Vaughan. So it seems to me, Cliff, that the builders of Lake Vaughan packed up, traveled across the entire world, to Lake Titicaca, somehow knowing everything about it, and then created almost a mirror of the exact same civilization there. 
The Chicana symbol is from the step pyramid symbol from the, the, the box relief at Kef. The, the the cross symbol is at is at Pumapunku, the exact same cross. Hmm. The same the same uh, T shaped pillar that I'm calling the Ascension pillar that became the Gobekli pillar and Menorca pillar in Spain, as well as this this pillar we see in Pumapunku, but it's got other more jagged edges to it. They they added extra edges. Um, I think it's a completion thing. But then there's it's like goes on and on and on. It's like they mimicked it. And then they created these civilizations to mimic around the world and then taught all these things. And then catastrophes came through and like wiped them all out. Every, yeah. I mean, wiped them out. Like that's why Machu Picchu, I believe, was originally built by the same group from Lake Vaughan. Because if you look at the descriptions of Haldi, how he's shown in his descriptions, it's identical to Viracocha. Identical. And it's not the same being as Kukukan and Quetzalcoatl either. Because they're feathered serpent beings that are about knowledge. I think that's more like Enki Thoth. Viracocha seems to be like basically a direct um, mirror of of Haldi from Vaughn with these like lightning bolts and controlling, being like a powerful, powerful god that is also does end up passing a ton of wisdom and knowledge. We have to look at this whole thing in a different light, I think, going forward and understanding cycles and energy and things. But the point I'm trying to make just before you jump in is just to say like, this linkage is around the world and it's profound. It's yeah. profound. And that's why so many people are coming together to uncover this mystery because it goes from Turkey to Saudi Arabia, to India, to Egypt, to South America, to Baalbek, Lebanon, to Greece, to Peru, to Mexico. It goes everywhere. Yeah, I think people are, are intuitively curious and they, they are reading about our history and going, this, something's missing here. There's there's missing links that we need to to discuss. I want you to, to talk a little bit about what you call the myth of Adapa. Sure. And the reason I like this is because I am fascinated about the creation of Homo sapiens sapien, the various yeah. levels. And when you talk about Noah, we read about their very amazing longevity, three, four, five, six, eight hundred years of age. Or more sometimes. And, and these are unique beings that must have had uh, a physiology that was very hardy to, to last that long. So like talk demigods. about that. I think it's the idea of kind of merging these higher beings of us, like like us, but with, um, with a mortal being. And then you get kind of a mix in between of a long longevity. But eventually as that bloodline becomes more diffused over time, yeah. Our ages, either, either, either somehow through manipulation, because it is weird how all of a sudden we became kind of capped off at 120. Yeah. That is weird. I will say there's something odd there that needs to be looked at. But it, it's, it's great that you brought that up because it's important that you look at. Let's look at the Sumerian king list, right? They say this is what they say, academics. Well, you're wrong about the age because you're you're wrong about the number of what is considered the age of a shar, s h a r. A shar right. is how they measure time in Sumer. They considered it in shars. So they would be like, well, King Ubara Tutu lived for this many shars. And then so academics are like, you guys got that wrong. It's supposed to be like months, not years. Um, it's impossible. There's a problem with that, though. There's another whole set of tablets called the Uruk list of kings and sages that came from a whole other city called Uruk that has the same, the same kings. Same thing. Mimicked from another time period, another one. Then they might not also know that there's another whole set of them as well from that region called the Barocious King List. Barocious was the high priest of Marduk in Babylon, no, but Marduk. not the new Babylon, the old Babylon. Mm. Babylon has an ancient history too that's older than people think. Babylon was actually conquered and rebuilt at a later time period as well. In the original Babylon, there were these ancient lineages, just like Sumer, of these kings that really did rule that long. And the evidence for that is just go read Genesis. It shows right in there, Noah in there that was 700 years old. Yeah. It's like we ignore the Christian side, too, and the Hebrew side that literally mimic it. But, okay, like, fine, you don't believe that. Let's add another whole one. Let's add the Egyptian <laughs> Turin king list from Egypt. Yes. Okay. Literally identical. It shows these dynasties of pharaohs over time. And it shows Khufu's group down the dynastic pharaohs later. They're like in a whole nother page. 
They're like way down the list, right? But at the top is this like original group, like Ra and all these others that are from completely different age. And I mean, isn't Osiris on that list? Yeah, and, Osiris and, I mean, and so, Ra and all these. Which they, like, they turn into gods because they're so far back in antiquity. Well, I think because I think that the, the royal lineage of who was ruling was directly connected to them. Yeah. Like it, it, there is a direct relation to that. But the, the, the Turin king list, or also known as the Egyptian king list, mimics the same thing. It mimics Sumer, mimics all these texts with, well, it shows these enormous lineages of these ancient, ancient Egyptian rulers. And then yeah. the, the number gets less and less and lower in age till it gets to the same ages that we are. And you're like, hmm, it's kind of weird, right? How is that mimicking all around the world, but yet, what does that mean? Well, it means that if that's true and the brain size jumped, doubled in size 200,000 years ago and something happened with Homo sapiens sapiens then and you add up the entire Sumerian king list, Uruk list of kings and sages or the ferocious king list or the Turing king list, and guess what you get? 200 wisdom change 200,000 years ago. I know. That's... So you, you got to look at that. You can't ignore it. And that's why I put Sharupak and Eridu in that timeline way up at the front. And then if I was going to add something to that, which I need to now, I would put Lake Vaughn and the Ararat civilization. Probably would have to put it something like, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I probably would have to put it at something like 50,000 years ago. See, I, I'm looking at the university professor listening to you. He's going like, the guy it doesn't make any point. other sense. It doesn't yeah, I make know. any other sense That's like logistically saying. wise because like, for instance, Edgar Casey, who I think was the only true channeler in the world that I actually like really, really respect in the way that he did, he gave this age of, of fifty thousand years for Atlantis being created. And also the Cuban geologist Iteralde um in Cuba who is investigating these underwater ruins off of Cuba that I did a whole episode with for Guy Ancient Civilization season five. He speculated that tectonic changes that could have led to that being subducted would have had to have been 50,000 years ago or so. It's really interesting that these numbers keep coming up and correlating because that's why I said Ionis is at least 20,000 years old. Because I think that that lost civilization chapter we're talking about, it ended at the Younger Dryas. It didn't start there. It ended there. That's when everything was destroyed and wrecked. And yeah. so what I mean by that is like, well, okay, so remember... The date that Plato is given by Solon for when Atlantis is destroyed is exactly the same date, 11,600 years ago or eight in that time frame for when the Younger Dryas shows this pulse water of massive events around the earth that flooded and subducted plates. It literally matches exactly. It means that we can create a timeline. It means that lost civilizations all around the earth were systematically destroyed during the Younger Dryas. Okay? So that means that they were destroyed at, we'll call it 12,000 years ago. But that means that the whole lineage of when all of them existed was before that. That's why I give this idea that, yeah, I think that was like this 50 to potentially 100,000 year per period of time that we created the most magnificent structures in, on earth and literally created a bond with heaven on earth with the stars and yeah. then forgot everything and forgot who we are. Yeah, I have the same feeling that you do. That 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 uh, there's the ancient civilizations, not only in Turkey, Egypt, but in the Americas, in China, and so forth. Yeah, China had a golden China, age. China, Japan, yeah. And and there was something that wiped them out. The big issue with orthodoxy is that where's the evidence? I mean, there's a famous story of Mark Lerner talking to Robert Shaka, like, show me the pot shards from. I can give you the evidence. Clip. But I, I've already come up with it. My yeah. feeling is that these buildings were there. They were reused by the pharaohs, yeah. and they put their cartouche on it. We now know that Ramses II was a... Ramses is a great example. Yes. Great example of oh, taking yeah. he was known a pyramids yeah. and making them his. These guys yeah. had egos that were off the charts. Uh, but make a few comments about that in terms of the antiquity and how we identify these earlier places and how that fits into this book epic of humanity. Well, we have evidence to, we're having emerging edit evidence coming forward that is supporting all of this <clears throat> in the way where, let me, 
provide that evidence. The first is that when we study some of these structures and places around the world that are showing that telltale sign of not being from the culture that we're told, highly advanced, highly sophisticated, same types of things we see, we, we, can, we can label them all and kind of map them out. And I did. I've done shows with Brian Forrester, if you want to check it out, where we literally discussed every single megalithic civilization around the world and tried to like categorize them all and catalog them all, okay? That endeavor is something that we need to go forward and take because it's becoming more apparent that that's not that hard to identify, to be honest. If you know what you're looking for, it's pretty obvious to see the difference. But having said that, still, like, what's the evidence? Well, I want to give a, a big piece of evidence, or two big, piece, two big pieces of evidence. One, I'll say three. First one is the stone, the hardness of the stone with the sophistication of what they built and the, and the tool marks left behind show us that it wasn't Bronze Age tools and there was some kind of tools they used to build them that we have no idea what it is. That is like a foundation right now that we right. don't know what could have made these scoop marks in Aswan. We don't know what did that. We don't know what made these saw marks in Abu Sir in Egypt or these drill holes in, in, in Peru and Bolivia that are perfect, literally perfect. We don't know. If anybody wants to nerd out on one of those types of things, go look at the altar at Ionis, that stone altar. Look right in the bottom of the altar. Somehow they drilled these tiny holes to create like a flower of life or a sun symbol at the bottom. How could they have done that? It's right. literally <laughs> mind-blowing to, to think that. But there's that. And then we, we add on to that these sites that we've now identified have extreme vitrification and damage on them. Spots where the rock is melted in a way where it's non-normal erosion. These indications that some extreme event, heat event, water event, like the Sphinx enclosure. That's what blew open this whole thing when Robert Baval met up with a rubber shock. And they said, that's not wind erosion on the Sphinx enclosure, proving that it had to been water, but it's a desert. So when did, it, when did it rain enough or flood enough to create that? That's the kind of consensus we're getting at. But I want to add the big one at the end that I don't feel like it's talked about nearly enough, Cliff. I guess it's a sort of part of my brand to talk about this. But when I've studied the most incredible megalithic um, aspects of these civilizations, the most grand work they ever took on, right? Go from Easter Island with the Moai. Largest Moai they ever created never made it out of the host rock. Didn't have any cracks in it or anything. So let's just separate that silly argument for a second. It never made it out of the host rock. But not only is it the biggest... It was three times larger than any existing Moai on the island. Stay with me here. Unfinished, left abandoned in the quarry, with, with several others as well. Same like they had, were about to take on something. This is the picture of the one that's massive that's still not completely yes, cut out of the quarry. Like this. He's like laying down. On yeah, the they, I, yeah. Up. Yeah. Now let's go to other places. Let's go to, say, Baalbek, Lebanon, right? Largest stones they ever created, over 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 tons, never made it out of the quarry. They were being shaped and fitted and moved, and they're literally still sticking out of the ground, and like they're half out. And you're like, oh, there's another example. Well, let's go to Egypt. Go to Aswan, Egypt. Largest obelisk ever created by far, by far, was, was being moved out of the rock. 700 tons. And they were about to move it, and then they abandoned it, and then, and then archaeologists would say, no, 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 look. There's a huge crack through the middle of it. That's why they abandoned it. Or the fact that it's been 50,000 years or whatever it was since it was carved and earthquakes and, and, and events cracked it. So now add that one. I mean, to be honest, Zeptepi is 38,000 years ago. So that, if you want to be honest, that's when I think Egypt was first built. If we want to give dates, is that there's a thing, there's a, it's a place called Ain Daro. Ain Dara, um, in Syria that gives these ancient datings that kind of match with, when we look at ancient Egypt, with Zeptepi on the wall for this 38,000 year period. But anyway, the point is, let's continue and let's go all the way around to China now. Let's go to the Yangshan Quarry in China, which is the single, by far, largest megalithic stone that was ever being moved everywhere in the world. And I don't even mean by a little, by a lot. The stone at the ancient quarry that was being moved, which we know is not natural, it has all the groove marks where they're cutting it, and then there's other ones that are already fitted in place called steles. That that section, that area, that stone, that giant Yangshan story, uh, Yangshan quarry stone, you see all the areas where it's about to be moved, all of them. It's like very, you can see it very clearly. They had 
they basically take these grooves out underneath and they carve it out and they somehow like lift it out of the host stone. However they did that, we don't know. But in all those examples of like the most supreme projects that these civilizations had all been taken on, and I would argue perhaps it was all happening at the exact same time, right? Around the world is that when you see all these projects that are of the most monumental scale possible, it means a couple of things. One, it means that that civilization they reached the height of its entire level of sophistication. First thing, not, not like weakening and disappearing. Right. Two, it means that, the work, that, that the, the work to stop happened suddenly and unexpected, right? And three, it means that because they can never come back to it, it means that they all died or like all were wiped out. Those are the three ways to prove that theory of saying, no, they had actually reached the height of the Golden Age. And then the Younger Dryas events were so extreme over a 1,500-year period, especially in the front and the back end, which doesn't even include the older Dryas. That is a whole other thing, too, is another part of it, too. But just imagine events with tsunamis and, and massive volcanism and maybe cosmic impacts, but to pretend, uh, potentially a whole host of things happening and literally causing that entire legacy of that group to be wiped out. To all that was left, Cliff, were a few survivors and sages and teachers from those civilizations that found all the indigenous groups around the world that already knew how to survive because they lived in the indigenous, like in basically within nature, that then they had to teach them or they would discover the remains but had no idea how to replicate it. Yeah. That's Great how point. I see our history and our story. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Matt LaCroix, we could speak for hours. We're, we're really down to our uh, final point here. Okay. This new book, The Epic of Humanity, um, what do you want people to get from the book? And, and uh, uh, what, what's, the, what's the message? Because it's one of many of your books. Of course, this is co-written with Billy. Billy Carson, yeah. It feels to me that it is funny because we're talking about this research project in Turkey it fits nicely with that. <laughs> it, it does. It actually does. In and fact, you may time, not have intended that at all. My timeline doesn't even need to change. I just need to add like the era of civilization into it. I don't even need to. Uh, anyway, um, the core is this. Humanity has been governed for far too long to make us think that we're nothing and insignificant in the universe. Whether or not it's through Darwinianism or just through any kind of an academic mind or through the industrial age. Various different reasons have, have come into place that have very much engineered our mindsets to think that we're nothing and that we're part of an empty universe and we're random and that, and that what happens to us doesn't really matter. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And really what the, the message in this book is, The Epic of Humanity, is for us to truly understand how epic our story is and who we truly are. The struggles and strives that we've come through, these incredible epics that... that great ascended masters have that barely survived and like taught other civilizations to carry on that story and message is, is so moving. It describes in the Atrahasis how when that first catastrophe is, is created to destroy the old world that the gods weeped at seeing humanity like destroyed. Like they, they, felt, they felt like they'd made the biggest mistake they'd ever made. And it was this moment where in time where we realized that we're obviously part of something great. We're obviously part of something that's far more important than just the randomness of thinking that we're not, that we're not a greater purpose than just the earth and the universe. And I would like to leave people during this time of challenges and time of transition into great ages to remember to have that peace of mind to sit out in nature and stare up and realize that you're part of the greatest story ever told. And you can be a hero in that story whenever you want to be. But in the end, you're, paying a, you're playing a pivotal role no matter what in the progression of how that all unfolds. And I feel greatly honored to be a part of the role that I'm playing to help tell this story in the way that it was intended all along. Mm, I love that, Matt. That's a great way to end our uh, time together. Uh, give people contact information. You gave us your... Um the stage of time for this documentary you're working on, but what, how can people learn more about you? Give yeah. us your uh, contact info. Check out my YouTube page at of course, Matthew LaCroix and the YouTube page, the stage of time.com. And we will have an entirely new 
massive social media campaign and branding around Ionis Legacy. So whoever's listening to this, get ready for new YouTube channel, all new content for that. We're going to be creating this whole, all these discoveries and bringing them all into another whole platform in addition to that, the ones that already exist. So get ready for just unbelievably exciting things in 2024. Two trips to Turkey, um, that other mystery country, um, Peru, Bolivia, Egypt. I mean, this, it's going to be amazing. So buckle up because this epic journey of doing all these incredible things and changing history has truly just begun. Fantastic, Matt. It's exciting to listen to you. I, I, I uh, uh, love it when you uh, are expressive, and this is all heartfelt material. So congratulations. And hey, thank, uh, you. thank you. Keep it up. Let us know, and we'll get you back on the program once you begin to uh, expose some of these findings to a, to a larger audience. Thank you, Cliff. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Let's let's connect again after I uh, come back from Turkey, okay? Definitely. Thanks again, Matt.